Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Fair Game Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Smith. I know, I know, it's exciting for all six of you, our listeners. We're very glad that the six of you are joining us today. Uh, and I'm really glad to actually have this guest on and introduce him to you. Today's guest, an accomplished performer, having performed for more than two decades, delighting audiences with magic and illusion. I met him a couple years back at the Florida Federation Affairs Annual Convention, where his performing ability and professionalism really got my attention. Happy to have him on the show today. Folks from Florida, this is Henry Rivera. What's up, sir? How you doing? I appreciate you welcoming me on to this amazing podcast amazing podcast well it's definitely not joe rogan man do you like have you have you done podcasts before i've done a couple of them yes you have done a couple it's like like joe rogan though you got it oh don't even give me that i look like (laughs) joe rogan hey man you don't have to kiss up i can't book you i'm not an entertainment manager it's not (laughs) you know you're talking up barking up the wrong tree on that so uh 20 years i was reading on your website you've been at magic for a long time yeah, I've been um, doing it. I, I got in magic in uh, 13, 12 years old, maybe. Okay. I'm 30, 31 years old now. Um, it, it's been a long, you know, I started in New York City and I started in the streets watching like David Blaine and I, I was doing like the close up magic and card magic and I right. started doing it in the streets and then I figured out you can hustle people and I became like a little con man. And I started doing like three card <laughs> money. Man, when you're it's when you when you're from the streets, that's part of it. Did you have a little three card money going on? Three card money, three shell game, and I was I was doing it, and uh, I got picked up by our entertainment company, Young, and they were like, "Hey, you know, we can book you for magic shows." And I was like, "Really?" And that was it. It kind of branched off into a magic career. What's really funny is how it, magic for almost everybody that I talk to, including myself, who who I'm a I'm a recovering magician. <laughs> I don't I haven't done magic in a long time, but it, it almost always starts as like it's just this fun hobby. Like I don't know, we see a magic show on TV or something, and then when we start doing some magic tricks, and then one day, if you're good enough, somebody goes, "Hey, I can pay you for that," and you're like, "Wait a minute, yeah, wait, I can." Yeah, yeah, and I was I was I was born in the streets, from Brooklyn, New York, and. It was tough out there, you know, so every little bit counted. And when I started making money, I was like, man, this is amazing. And that's it. So from New York, you were born in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. As Alicia Keys would say, concrete jungle where dreams are made of. And then you were like, nah, I'm going to Florida. <laughs> New York's crazy. <laughs> it is. You know, we were, my wife and I, how many times I've been, I think I've been, I've only been in the city like two or three times in my life. And I was young when I, when it happened. The last time, the only time as an adult, um, 2017 and 2018, BizBash, which is a corporate events convention, kind of like mm-hmm. how Florida Fairs, but they're for corporate events. They were doing a deal at the a big, a trade show at the Javits Center. And I was like, well, let me see if I can get the fortune machine up there at the Javits Center and see how it works out. Man, they, I thought they charged a lot for everything then. And now I see this thing on the news where they're going to, if you're driving, if you're coming into New York, we're charging you. Yeah. Like a daily fee they're going to charge him up there. Last time I was in New York, the one of the bridges, I forget which one, um, the toll was like $35. One way. Yeah, one way. And I was like, well, <laughs> this is too expensive for my blood. <laughs> I know. So you went south to Florida. Now, how long have you been down in Florida now? Um, Has to be probably at least going on 10 years. Oh, okay. So it's been a bit since you've been back up in the city. Uh, no, I'm 18. I moved out here like 18, 19. Yeah. Okay. Uh, probably, yeah. So we're going so, up a little bit more than 10 years, probably. It's a little bit different down there on the in Florida. You said now you were, you said before the show, is it Land of Lakes you said you're you're in? Yeah, I'm in Land of Lakes. It's Tampa. Um, yeah, greater Tampa metro. But quite a different, I, quite a change from uh, from New York City, from Brooklyn. It's, I'll be honest with you. And when I moved out here, I was like, this is the life. This is amazing. There's, it's open. And then now, like in the last two years, you just start seeing developments after left and right. And I'm like, this is another New York City again. Yeah, it is. At last time. So last a year ago, um, I had three fairs down in Florida. This year, I've got my run in Arizona starting in March. Um, but I could not. I lived in Florida and in, in with what Sarah and I did for a year and a half in Orlando. And I could not believe how much traffic like you. There was always traffic in Orlando. But at one point I was down in, um, I was doing Martin County um, last year and 
one of the mornings, because it's one of those fairs that doesn't open till like 5 p.m., one mm-hmm. of the mornings I'm going to drive down to Miami. Now, once obviously, once you get down to Miami, the traffic is always insanity. Yeah. But I couldn't believe like 20 miles north of West Palm Beach is where the traffic started on 95. And it was, I don't think we got above 25 miles an hour all the way down into Miami. It was insane. When I moved to Florida, it took me about 30, 45 minutes to go to um, Disney. Now it takes me almost an hour and a half to two hours to go to Disney. Oh, yeah. Driving up I-4? Mm-hmm. Forget about it. It's insane. But yeah. I I love New I love Florida. It's so much more peaceful. Yeah. <laughs> Well, New Florida, York. we we were saying, you know, Florida is where you and I ended up meeting. It was the last, um, wasn't this, wasn't May of 23, but it would have been um, May of 22. Mm-hmm. Um, I was on board for Florida Fed at that point. And I remember I wanted to make an effort to come by and meet everybody and, yeah, you, and you shake hands at the trade show. And there was something about you because, I mean, obviously being in this industry as long as I have, magicians come and go, man. Like there's so many magicians, but there was something that just caught my eye about you. I was like, there's something different on this this dude um you know he's not doesn't strike me as like some uh, sure i've looked at you know your videos and your your website there's a lot of the tricks you do or and once you've seen one magic trick especially when you're a magician you've seen kind of them seen them all mm-hmm. but there was just something about how you carried yourself you didn't have the um i'm gonna say smugness it, it could be the wrong word but you didn't have the smugness that a lot of magicians them. Yeah, like you were just super chill and professional and and courteous, and I was like, all right, cool. This this cat's gonna fit in here. Um, so that was your was that your first convention that you had done? The first convention, yes. That was um that was my first ever fair convention ever. Like, oh, so not just for Florida, like that was your ever. foray into the fair industry. In in general, yeah, that was my first in. Um, before that, I used you know performed in New York. I did birthday parties, and I, I, I had. You opportunities to perform at like coney island on oh, the, nice. right on coney island there was a freak show and they okay. had magic and i was able to do like weekly or every other week or something like that i was doing shows there gotcha so i definitely have my field in the business like my, my foot in the business but but that was your first step into into the fair industry yeah, how just, what were you what was your vibe on that first convention how did you feel it went um it was good. I liked it. Um, it was different. So I didn't know what to expect. It wasn't my first yeah. everything. So I didn't know what to expect. Um, I was blessed and put outside the convention hall. De- <laughs> depending on where you were, because boy, there were some people that were stuck in a corner that were pissed. Yeah. yeah. So um, I was blessed and I, I, they put us, I guess they were overbooked. I don't know what it was, um, but they put us outside. They put like 15 of us, 20 of us outside in the hallway right. out in the foyer outside the room yeah and um but i was able to get like the perfect back wall so as you, soon as you walk, turn right or turn left you see me yeah and it, it was perfect it was you perfect. had the like there were about of the like the 12 or 15 booths that were outside there were like six that were prime time and every everybody else was kind of stuck in the that back corner of the foyer and you know i, I was because i was on the on the board i asked i was like what what's going on here? Some of these people are really upset. And I guess that's Florida's heart's always in the right place with that. Cause they don't want it when there was, it's one thing if you've got like 200 additional boosts and you're like, we just don't have the space. Yeah. But there were just those handful of extra and they don't want to turn people away. They really want to be open when Florida and bring, invite people in to be part of the Florida affairs family. So their heart was in the right place. I think just that given spots, the execution just, it wasn't meant to work out, it, it um, but I guess uh, if, and it happens, you know, it's like I, but my thing I, uh, I had said was, listen, if this comes up again, put my booth out there, put like uh, Mark Dobson or Danny Grant or people that you all really know, put us out there and put the new people inside because yeah, we yeah. like, we know if they're going to, if they want to come find me, they're going to come find me. They're going to come they find Mark Dobson, yeah. but yeah. give the new people a better bite of the apple. And it was irrelevant at that point anyway, because after that was our last year in Naples and now these next several rooms that we're moving like last year in Orlando, that room was enormous and fit it everybody. It did. Yeah. And I think everyone had good, good, good clearance. And I didn't think anyone felt like my booth was shoved in the corner and in, in this past year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there were some concerns about, I guess the audio levels with the, um, 
with the showcase stage that's in there. But man, that's uh, that's a constant battle because it's every every convention I go to that has a showcase stage like that in the trade show, and I think it's it's a double edged sword, and it just is what it is. Like it's 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 a fun way for people, an excellent way for people to get some exposure, whether it's a magician or a band. But if it's the volume still out, it's blowing people out, then it becomes a conflict. And and my thought now um, is I think they should do like a three-hour session, and it should be like two hours where it's trade show. And then that third hour, they should do like three showcases in that third hour so that people can still mingle. It loosens up the environment a little bit, maybe have a, a cocktail hour or something during that. And so I don't know. I, I'm off the board, so I'm not privy to it. I don't know what Florida Fed's coming up with this year, but um, I know there it's were some – they, they're going to learn as they go. That's the way yeah. we, we're, we're not perfect, you know, and they did their, they did the best. And in, in that given opportunity, my first yep. year, I, I made the best of it. You know, we, yep. we don't. Well, in this um, past year, when, when Cheryl flood was helping kind of oversee the trade show, if I'm not mistaken, it was her first year on trade show. Cause I think Fran had done it previously. And so this was more Cheryl this past year. And I thought Cheryl did a fantastic job with it. You like, you're just not going to, it's funny. I literally recorded um, an hour and ago with uh, Carly Schultz from the Nebraska State Fair, and one of the things we came up with was like, you can't please all the people all the time, and sometimes all those people show up at the trade show. Like, you know, mm-hmm. but but Cheryl did. A, I think she did a fantastic job, especially handling some of the the complaints and the rumblings because I don't know. You're new to the industry, but have you picked up yet that some of us in the on the associate side can be a little bit extra. <laughs> we can be a little bit difficult to deal with. And I, I grew up in New York city and I don't let anything bother me or I just, I'm in my own little bubble. Yeah. And I try to, I try to just be me no matter what. Yeah. And if, if somebody else is being extra, I'll just, I just say, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'll just go be me. Yeah. You know, but well, and I'll tell you this, if I can, as someone who's a seasoned veteran to somebody like you, who's new to the industry, not necessarily at entertainment, but to the industry, if I gave one bit of advice, it would be, um, let things roll off a lot quicker. Cause there were, there's been a few times where stuff I've let stuff get to me and then in my, and my filter turns off like the older I get, I'm 44. So the older I get, the more I'm just like, I'm going to say what I think. And then I walk away going. I shouldn't have said what I thought. <laughs> and I know I've ruffled some feathers along the way. And in, in the fair business, I, I think you have to uh, be able to be on spot. You have to be quick with it. You, you can't, yep. you can't just be by the books because you never, especially as an entertainer, you never know what's going to happen. Right. You know, yeah. nothing's perfect. We're living in a world where we're entertaining people that come from all types of worlds into this business or come yep. to a fair. You don't know who's at these fairs or exactly. what they're thinking bad their day was you, you don't know anything so you you got to keep it you got to keep it on the, on on very impromptu you just got to go with it go with the flow yeah and that's i'm i continue to work on that um you know there's only been a few times that i've really ruffled feathers but it's like some of them i was like that's not you know that's my fault I, you know i should have i should be more more thoughtful or you know, a little less careless. And then other feathers I've ruffled along the way that I'm like, I do not care. <laughs> we do, what was it? Is it the Stephen A. Smith meme? We do not care. That's, you know, is what it is. So oh, your first convention now, did you book anything out of Florida that first year? Um, My first year in, I booked, surprisingly, I booked Pasco County Fair. Okay. Um, That was my first booking of, of a Florida fair. And, um, it there did my run and I, I didn't expect I didn't expect anything you know I, I yeah. talked to people and they were like ah it takes a couple of years to get into the door and especially all that with stuff. Florida because it is so packed with entertainers that want to work like January to April so they really have it's a complete buyer's market they can do they can you know pick and choose yeah so I didn't I didn't expect anything but I got that one surprisingly did my run and um that was pretty much it for that year um but i did network with other entertainers and yeah. other entertainers did branch out to me and help me with other gigs yeah so i'm thankful for that too so um yes i booked my first florida gig but i also met other people who helped me get like two more fairs that year oh from, good yeah so, so out of state and stuff like that so that you know that helped out yeah it's it's interesting get in with the right people and like we will all help each other 
I, you know, I help promote. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I don't, I don't even like, I don't even need somebody to scratch my back, back at me. I just, my thing is I see, I've, I've been in long enough where I see the talent pool and there's all sorts of different levels of the talent pool. And I'm like, you know, sometimes there's somebody like you that's, that's up and coming within the industry. And I'm like, you know, they probably, they need a shot. Like they need to be brought, you know, give them a hand up and, and, and see if we can't speed things along. Cause like you said, there are people that'll tell you, Oh wait, Florida can take three or so three to four years or so to crack. So, but if you got one, especially if it, if you got Jim Ward in your back pocket, cause he's a really good dude. Like he really, he, he's so knowledgeable about his fare and what's going on. And he, he can look at an act and know what's going to fit in on his property. Cause you know, that, that grounds in Pasco is weird. Yeah. There's rolling hill. Like it rolls this hill and, and down around in the corner. Yeah. Down. Where, did, where were you at that fair? Were you strolling or were you on a stage? I was on the stage. I was at the back porch theater. Um, all the way down at the end. All the way down at the end. Yeah. And, and so, that's a tough one, man. That is a tough venue to work. Cause it's out of the, it's in, down in a corner. It's all the way at the end of the fairgrounds. How did, how did that work out for you? Um, Tracy, Tracy helps with the, the Tracy, Jim Ward. They all, they really, they really do put their foot in them that fair. They're very involved. And um, we definitely were trying different ideas to bring more people to the shows. And we are just, we were always trying to work with each other to like, how can we get more people back here? How can we help this and this and this? And, and so we definitely were like, all the entertainers were working together too. We were, hey, make sure you check out right after my show. Uh, I, yeah. I, I was, I was um, doing it. Brad Matchett was doing the um, yeah. hypnosis. And I was like, after my show, don't be afraid to go right to Brad's show and enjoy his hypnosis show. Yeah. And um, so, so we were definitely all working with each other and that's great. You know? Yeah. Did I see that um, you did the summer workshop for Florida fed? I did. I did. Um, uh, may he rest in peace. Hal Porter. Yeah. Sad that what happened with him. Um, but he was a very nice guy. Yeah. But Hal Porter gave me a, sh a call one year and he said, Hey, I, I know you're new. I, yeah, I know you're local. Uh, would you be interested in doing the summer workshop for us? I think it'll be a great opportunity for you to just show everyone your skills and your capabilities. And I was like, how anything, you know, I helped out. I did two years in a row for them. I helped out um, Doris do her baking contest. Yeah. And I, I was the judge over there. So, um, you know, he, he, he definitely opened the doors for me on that and he allowed me to perform over there. And I gave them, a, uh, I did my best as I can. Um, were you there? Did you come this year? I didn't make it down. Oh, man, it was amazing. You should have seen we had smoke effects and the lights and it, it the best show you've probably ever seen. You, <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> floor, you were floor, there. It was amazing. Floor workshop, <laughs> best show in the world. In the world, that was it. Level one show. You That's cool seen. though, because it's like it's it's a, your own private showcase opportunity, basically. It was. It was pretty much, and um, I, I did the show and met people. My family was there with me. Um, my daughter pretty much like met everyone. So <laughs> like, she, if it wasn't for my daughter, they probably didn't care about me but my daughter was there at oh man if you mean leverage what you can when when uh our son was how old's your daughter she's five yeah see when nate was about that age he's 13 now but he would come to conventions and he learned it was learning to shake people's hands and hand them a flyer and and we had like five or six and people would look at him like it's a cute kid like i think there's probably a couple of gigs i got because of nate <laughs> <laughs> and you get him where you can but yeah, yeah. she definitely she definitely made friends there and um, we definitely made friends and it was just a great, great, all around great opportunity. And I appreciate how for doing that for me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so, for context, for anybody listening, we're recording today, February 2nd. Um, I'm not sure when this goes to air. I think it's in the next, by the end of the month or right the first week of March, but for context, how Porter uh, was the fair manager for Citrus County fair in Inverness, Florida. And a week ago today, he passed away. Um, I'm not sure at this point if it's been announced what happened. I don't know if it was heart attack or what. Um, but he was a uh, he was a really interesting guy. You know, he used to be a speechwriter for politicians. Oh wow! Yeah, when I found that out like five or six years ago, I was like, "Wait, how? 
really like this because he was like if you looked the at how man you'll ever meet super nice man but he was like the good old boy a good old boy like he was the farmer joe kind of vibe like he just was such a unassuming guy and then you find out wait you were a speechwriter really and i want to say it was back in the god it might have been back in the late 70s or 80s it was a a senator or a governor i forget um i'd have to go back and and do a little digging but yeah, I mean, so it's like it's not an easy task to be a speechwriter uh, for a politician like that. And I guess yeah. how of all people did that. So mm-hmm. God rest his soul. Yep. Uh anyhow, so let's uh let's get um back on your show. Um we haven't really talked. We we know you do magic and illusion, but what can if if I'm a fair manager booking your show, what can I expect to see? Um magic and illusions. That's fabulous. That's a great answer, Henry. And that's our show. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> no, it's a, it's an interactive magic show. Um, very, very with comedy. We have comedy involved. We ha- we try to do it family friendly. Um, I I personally, I enjoy magic shows a lot. I love seeing magic shows. And the only thing that killed me about magic shows was that they just, they didn't have that connection with the audience. Sometimes they're just up there like, look at me, look at me, look at me. Just doing the trick doing the tricks and for some for me that was very like dude you're given an opportunity to to perform your magic in front of thousands of people do something and so so I took the opportunity and said look I grew up in the streets and it was it was hard for me I grew up in the streets of New York single mom raising three kids it was very tough you know in 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 Brooklyn and um I always said that if 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 I didn't do magic, my life would have been different. And I, I in my magic show, I try to tell people that I, I try to give them a motivational message in my show and saying, like, mm. just don't give up on your dreams. Yeah. Like, like don't I, I try to reach to them and just don't don't reach up. Don't give up, you know, because if I could do it, if I could become what I wanted to become since I was 12 years old, 13, become a professional magician and perform for thousands of people. Yeah, you can do anything, you know, like, yeah. And, and so I try to bring that out in my show and just teach people like, don't give up no matter what your situation was, just keep believing in yourself, believe in your dreams. And, um, so I try to help the kids and I just, I just want to give them for that 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it is that I'm on that stage. I just want people to really feel what it's like to be entertained happily, forget all their stress and just, just be really involved in the show and be happier than when they came into the fair, you know? Yeah. Well, and you're trying to give them a, it sounds like you want to give them a moment. Like I want to give them a moment. It's special. It's, yeah. a, it's just, you're giving me, they're part of my dreams. They're, they're making me live my dreams and, and I want them to f- be appreciated and thankful for the opportunity that they're, they're giving me. And I want to make sure I'm not wasting their time. Yeah. You yeah. Know, no, I, I get I, it. Cause there's so many magicians you see in performers in general that you can tell that there's a disconnect on some performers where it's like, you can tell they're there for the ego of it. Yeah, And then you get the performers that who's like you seem to be that it's like, there's, you really enjoy doing this. Like, and you, but you also, it seems like Henry, that you understand your place and where you fit into this. Like you're performing at fairs. You're not David Copperfield. You're not, you know, entertaining in front of, you know, 50 million people or whatever. Like if you, if you can make it a, a moment for, one family for one kid that looks at you and goes, this is so cool. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what we're there for? Exactly. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, these fairs and uh, in my mind, and and I'm sure other fairs probably operate. Some, some of these families are for the, uh, there's a lot of families come to these fairs from low class and they're not able to lower socioeconomic groups. Yeah, Yeah. They're not able to go to, Disney, they're not able to go to Universal or yeah. go to Six Flags, any of that stuff. Yep. And so this the state fair, the local fair, they're they're looking forward to the coming to these fairs. Yep. Yeah. And they they're not gonna like they waste a lot of money at these fairs, you know. They buy the food. They they spend a lot of money, Henry. They don't waste it. <laughs> well, look, I'm not editing that out. <laughs> but that's it. Can- I just got canceled. <laughs> <laughs> don't book him. No, um, they, they spend a lot of money at these fairs and yep. they, they buy their, the, the food, which is amazing food. And they come to see these entertainers and they, the kids at the 4-H programs do amazing. Like they put yep. a lot of these kids put, they, they come to these fairs and put heart and soul and blood and sweat and tears into these fairs. 
And I, I feel like give them that, give them that respect of, I'm not going to waste your time when you come to these fairs. I'm going to give you something that you deserve. I'm going to give you the yeah. entertainment that you guys deserve. I'm going to make sure you guys are happy. I'm going to make sure that everyone's treated right. Yep. And I, I think that's what's really important is just remembering who you are as a person and why you're there. Yeah, that's what, and I, man, I approach it the same way when I do the fortune machine. It's like some people are just going to come hit the button and hear the goofy joke and take the fortune card and be like, okay, that was something. Yeah. But I didn't realize what the impact of that act was until I switched years ago. I switched the fortune cards from being just kind of a goofy fortune cookie thing to having something meaningful on it. Mm -hmm. And I would search the hashtag for like, you know, hashtag OC fair or wherever I was at. And I would see all of a sudden, like there were young girls that were like 16 or 17 that would post it on their Instagram. They, they taped it to their bathroom mirror so that they could read it every morning oh, before wow. they went to school. And that's when I was like, wait a minute, there's something there, you know, I'm giving them a moment. And then you'd realize two years later, when you'd see these like big, tough dudes, they like big, tough cowboy dudes would come back. There was, I'm telling you once I come back to a fair and the guy opens his wallet and he's like a gruff looking cowboy guy <laughs> opens his wallet and he goes, still got my card from last year. And I was like, I'm, I'm in the moment of performing. Right. So I can't break character. I'm the machine. I'm the, I'm the, the you remember that. You automaton, remember that. but then mm -hmm. I'm like, what? <laughs> like this big tough dude, whatever. And I don't know what it said on that given card, but whatever it was resonated with him and, and he keeps it, you know, and, and you got it. You got to have the same thing where, and you'll find it for sure in fairs where people will come back. Like if you go do Pasco again, you're going to have a kid come back. Because I've watched it and I've watched other performers that there's a guy out in uh, California who works mainly in the California circuits. He's a kid's magician, Frank Thurston. Um, he's got to be one of the best kids performers I've ever seen in my entire life. And I was out at OC Fair with him once and he was talking to this um, this mom and her son. And I want to say the son was like. I don't know, 19 or 20. Cause I remember they were talking about, Oh yeah, he's off at such and such a college or whatever. Uh, he's about to go back to school in August, that kind of thing. And I go up afterwards and I was talking to Frank. And he goes, see that kid I was talking to. I said, yeah. And he goes, I pulled him up on stage at this fair when he was like six years old and they came every year. Like, so you're going to get those, the longer you're in this industry, you're going to get those moments. And that's when you're like, okay, I'm making a difference. I'm doing something cool. You're doing the right, you're doing the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, How, yeah, that's, pretty, that's pretty much what it comes down to me and performing in my show. I just, I just want to be able to give them that moment. Yes. And, and I don't know, man, I'm trying, I'm like getting contemplative of like the moments that we make for people, you know, we're not, we are not Taylor Swift. We are not David Copperfield. We don't have a reach of millions and tens of millions. Like, but if the reach is that one kid that goes, Oh, oh I could, oh, if you have one kid that looks at you and goes, maybe I could be a magician or maybe I can, I can do, I can be a, a streamer or be a gamer. Or could, like I can do this. I have it all the time. When I do, when I talk about that piece in the show, you can just see the people in the head nodding their heads like, wow. And I, the other, I, I did a, um, a farm, a local farm. And I did their like their pumpkin festival and you can see people nodding like their girlfriend, like nudging like, the girlfriend. Like, Hey, look like he's, you know, like, don't give up. Yeah. And it's, you know what? I think it's such an important message. It, it almost seems, seems, I don't want to say corny, but like repetitive because we hear it so much, but I don't think we listen to it enough. And I think we're living in an age here, especially in the United States, where the, especially the kids, they're so bombarded by negativity on TikTok and Instagram. And, you know, they tie up their entire self worth and likes and follower counts. And it's like, monetary fame it's just so ridiculous and and I, being at 44 being a uh i guess they technically say i'm a zennial like because we i and born in 79 you're on the cusp of like you're a gen xer but you're also kind of a millennial we came of age in an in an analog age where there were no computers like you figured out where your homies were because you rode your bike up and down the street the block until you were like oh there's the pile of bikes mm -hmm. in the front yard you know they're at they're at danny's house so they, we're gonna go hang out there but then we we came of age and all of a sudden this stuff was here. I feel bad for these youngsters that are like my son at 13 and 
they're growing up in nothing but a digital world that is so much chaos. So I think that when you, when you can break them away from that and they go to the fair and they see Henry Rivera doing cool magic and he's this cool cat that, that is doing something different and has this message of, you know, you, you can do this, you know, you can, you can chase your dreams and don't give up on them. Maybe it makes a difference. We hope you know we can only hope um so i mean is that what motivates you you think to to keep doing this yeah i i always said if i was born a millionaire i would do something to change people's lives and i'm not saying that like to win the mr florida of the year you know like i'm not mr <laughs> mr or anything i'm not you know um but if i could i would you know like i, I think you, you want to change people's lives that's the reason we do this is to show yeah. them real magic i mean Granted, it's sleight of sleight of hand and tricks and stuff like that, but it's that moment of belief of wow, this is real. Like this is cool. This is something a miracle just happened in front of my eyes, and giving them that opportunity of just just reaching out. I think that that's, that's what motivates me a lot is just being able to just really touch with people and give them that moment. I feel that because to me, like the real, it's interesting the dichotomy of a magic show. The real magic isn't the pulling the rabbit out of the hat or cutting the lady in half and putting her back together. The real magic is when you get that connection with somebody in the audience and then they go home and with that moment, with that memory and 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 have maybe they change something in them where they go, you know what? I was going to give up on, I don't know, being an author, but maybe yeah. I'll give it one more shot. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. You know, make, make changes in people's lives. That's what, that's what we got to do. Absolutely. Have you, so thus far in the industry, any challenges you faced that you were like, ah, I got to figure this out. And how do you overcome uh, those challenges? I see there's, I mean, there's always challenges as a performer and there's always challenges as, especially as a, um, anyone who's just trying to make their dreams come true. Um, I just don't, don't lose focus of me. I, that's, I mean, that's at the end of the day, I just say, you know what, I'm Henry Rivera and I'm, 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 being, I'm Henry Rivera. I have a goal. I have a, a, a finish line for my goal and all these little obstacles that keep hitting me during me reaching this finish goal. It's just, you're not doing anything to me. It's, it's, it's just making me stronger. Like you just can't, you can't stop. You can't, you can't give up. You just got to keep yeah. pushing. It's always going to be obstacles. And, um, Steve Harvey, there was a, there's a, there's a, a video of Steve Harvey talking on YouTube of he's saying like, just leap or jump. Like you're always going to have an, an issue in life. There's always going to be a money issue. There's always yep. going to be, what if I don't have enough money? Well, I got a job. What if, like life's too short. Like don't, you can have millions of dollars and you're still going to have a money issue. You're still yep. going to have like, well, and if you just, wait, if you wait till every, if till you think everything's perfect, it's never going to be perfect. Exactly. Yeah, no, well, I get I, it's, I, I, I think that's so interesting that you say that, that if you wait, if you think, you know, if I just have a million dollars and for the longest time, um, you know, when I was starting out in the industry, there were years that I was making like $28,000, $31,000. And I'm like, you know, I'm feeling like a failure because here I am as a father and a husband that feels like I should have that traditional male role of being the provider and protector and the yeah. responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And I always kept thinking, well, if I just make more, if I just make more, if I just, well, you know, here I am now 44 years old, um, married 19 years this summer, and I'm making, I make really good money, but somewhere somewhere around i don't know the sixty thousand or dollar or so mark even though i can they're uh, on a really good year i can double that now there's mm -hmm. no additional like happiness or comfort that comes with the extra because there's a certain point where it's like oh my needs my basic and i think even i think jordan peterson might have even talked about this at one point like there's a certain there's a certain number and of course it's going to with inflation and whatnot it'll change every year but somewhere around like $65,000 or something like that, once you know, your basic needs are met, there's very little increase in happiness with, with additional money. Because at our core, when your basic needs are taken care of, that's what really matters. It's mm -hmm. not whether or not like you have lots of things or you have, you know, do you drive a Ferrari or do you have a Rolex or anything like that? 
it's like your basic needs. You know, you have your home, you have your, is your, your, you got your health, is your wife and your kids, they're good. Like, that's all that matters. Yeah. And, and the as more long money, as food, on the, food on the table every night for you guys to eat, some hot water to take a shower. Yeah. Place to call home. That's at the yeah. end of the day. That's it. I mean, it, it's making more can provide additional experiences, you know, it could provide additional ownership of things, but, you know, it's funny, the more things that I've acquired in my life, the more I realize that I don't own these things. These things own me, Yeah. you know? And it's like, I was, I was so excited when I got my truck, my big diesel. Cause I'm like, cool. Now I can get my trailer. And, and then it's like, man, the level of responsibility for that thing is making sure, cause those things get freaking expensive. And it's like, so wait, what, who, who owns what here? Does an F-350 own me? Cause that's kind of what it feels like sometimes, you know? Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. It's, you do, you definitely can't lose focus of reality. Yeah. Really, really, really matters. And to and, me, like my family is what really matters to me and our happiness and, and, and just have my daughter. I mean, just showing her um, between me and my wife, just giving her that opportunity of seeing like, don't giving up and working towards every goal you guys have. And, just you guys just it. have the one daughter? I only have one daughter, yeah. 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 How long have you guys been married? Uh, well, we're not technically married. But <laughs> we've, been for, we're, we've been together for almost 10 years. I mean, oh, so we're common law. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, good. You know, she's, got, she's got a ring on it. And so, you know, you we guys, just got to plan the wedding and that's it. How'd you guys meet? Um, so, I worked, uh, I worked in a mechanic shop years ago and I was the manager there. And I was making, I mean, it comes down to the fact I was making a lot of money at this place to be in a regular job and a manager. I was making a lot of money and even the happiness, like making almost a hundred thousand a year. And that just didn't stop to the happiness. I was just miserable at this company. Right. See, money does not always make people. It's not, there's a lot more to it. Yeah. I was there 24 seven. I didn't have a life. I was exhausted. It was just, it was just, I was not happy. And um, we met there. She came in for tires on her car. And, and it just, from that moment, it just, we just connected. That's cool. She's like, I got a flat tire. I need new tire. My tires are are kind of old. And you're like, here, I'll get you new tires and a boyfriend. (laughs) And here's my number. Nice, man. What's her name? Uh, My wife's Christine. Christine. Cool. And my daughter, Sophia. Christine and Sophia. And I'm guessing they are the light of your life. Yes, pretty much. Everything's for them. That's awesome. Well, I man, I tell you what, so far watching your young career in this uh in the fair industry at least, it looks like you're off to a good start. You know, you're making good connections and and the thing I think in talking to you um that I couldn't put my finger on it when I first met you that I was like, gosh, something about this cat that I like is uh there's a, a humbleness and humility about you that you you doesn't you don't come across as trying to be too ego inflated or too big for anybody like you know who you are you're comfortable with who you are and man i think that's a really admirable quality and and that's i mean i bring that to the show we bring that to the show we bring we bring me to the show you know i um i tried doing the cruise ship business and i i just i felt like i was too street for the cruise ship business the way i talk and yeah the way i, the way I carry myself and I, I just felt fake it wasn't me you yeah. know had and a little imposter came, syndrome going on. Yeah. And then when I came to the fairs, um, it was just like, yeah, this is, this is it. This is where I belong. Like, this is more me. I'm more personable. People can relate to me. You yep. know, it's, it's not, it's not seeing some guy on stage and dressing in a white tux. And, and it's like, <laughs> oh, cool. He's, he, you know, he's cool. The tricks are great and all that stuff. The music's great. Everything's great. But like, it's, is that really who he is? Yeah, you know, for like, sure. And I, I bring that, that, that I bring me to the show. And I think that's where my show stands, you know, different from a lot of other entertainers is I'm not trying to be anyone different than who I am on stage. Yep. You know, it's yep. just, it's really me. You see me. Yeah, no, totally agree. Who, um, just curious, you got a favorite mm-hmm. magician? I mean, we all have that one, one, it's if we grew up in magic, probably, you're probably not going to recognize their names um you know i mean there's great magicians like david copperfield still an inspiration sure. david blaine still an inspiration chris angel still an inspiration these are these are inspirations because 
the um, impact they did on their magic career. I mean, they're like a list celebrities, you know, well, like, in the industry at, at large. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So how they're, many they're jobs okay. did, did David Blaine create just by doing that show on ABC? Well, of course. With so, yeah, Bengali magicians tech. Were, yeah. And, and, and magicians were wanted, you know, like Doug Henning, Doug Henning, yep. if you did magic before Doug Henning, you were a loser. When Doug Henning started doing magic, he made it cool. He made it cool again. Yep. You were instantly cool if you were a magician because of yep. Doug Henning. So, um, you know, and there's Harry Blackstone. and But when it comes down to my personal favorite, I mean, Roy Benson. Roy Benson's a very old school magician. Yeah, Benson uh, Bowl, yeah. Manning Pollock, you know, uh, Al Flasso, you know, uh, Di Vernon, you know, Fred yeah. Katz, Malini, you know, Charlie Miller. Like, these are my magicians. Those are the magicians that for sure. grandfathers. Those are the guys that you read their books and you're like, man, these guys were beyond, like, they were just beyond their level for where they were at at that time. Yep. Yep. They were creating magic. And people were still, I have a postcard um, from Cardini and it says to the guy who stole my patter, your new, you're with, with forgiveness, your new friend Cardini. <laughs> and it just, people were stealing people's material. Yeah. And and for Cardini to call you out, that was like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, like, like, like but they probably didn't know at that time. Cardini was just an entertainer. They he didn't know he was gonna make such an impact for history on magic. You know. Yeah, yeah, that's that's um that's wild. I think my favorite magicians. Um, I got two of them. Um, Matt King, I love Matt, Matt King. King. He's I don't know if he's still performing. Is he still out in Vegas? He's still doing yeah, at I Harris. I think he's in a different hotel. I'm not a hundred different venue sure. now. The thing I liked about Mac is like. And it's the same thing I like about my other favorite performer. Um, it's like the show happens in spite of the magic. It's not about look at this cool trick and, mm-hmm. and super mysterious power I have. He, his, the fact that he can pack a, a large Vegas showroom size show into a suitcase with like a deck of cards and a, and a Mickey Mouse poncho or whatever is pretty wild. And his, like and his, and his couch looking suit. <laughs> oh god his suit then that's part of who this part of his character's whole bit yeah but he's um, legendary and then my other favorite is um is actually down the road for me there he's in orlando at wonderworks tony brent you ever gone to see his show i have not seen his show i heard of the name go check it out he's um he's the guy that does magic and there was a one point he was like i want to have the magic show that has no magic tricks in it <laughs> like that's what he was trying to do he got down to the point where he was at like I forget like three magic tricks maybe in the whole show. Cause so much of it yeah. became like sight gags and just how can he facilitate a great experience for the audience and his, his um, bill and lemon routine is like for all the bill and lemon routines I've seen, I look at that one and it plays like 15 minutes and it's like a lemon, a, a Sharpie and a borrowed dollar bill. You're like, oh, you need- yeah, and he'll go like I think it's twelve, maybe it's twelve minutes. I'm like, it's a long piece, but nobody when it's done, you're like, wait, was that that long? You don't realize it because it flows so beautifully. Yeah. No, yeah. and that's that's the best magic. I mean, um, Eugene Berger has like a, I mean, I won't quote him on words, but it's something similar of the long day. Don't, it's not about the tricks. You know how many tricks you know. It's it's just doing those tricks good. Like uh, Bruce Lee says, I fear the man who not knows who who knows three kicks than the man who's kicked a thousand times something like that yeah yeah it's well isn't that how so many magicians start out it's just about chasing and buying that next trick that next trick that next trick and it's like you know if you you find if you find like the really greats like you think about gazo like when i started out doing street stuff like gazo was the inspiration for me and i'm like he could go 45 minutes to an hour and do like three tricks cups and balls and that's the cups and balls and uh, he would do like the floating card on the stick i forget where that originally came from and then he would do like like 20 minutes long and he hasn't even done the magic yet yeah and and he would do like a silk trick or a vanishing bill or something like super like one or two things to gather the crowd but the show itself so that's when i realized when i started looking at like how do you format a show when i looked at gazos i was like wait a minute in the whole street environment like when he was doing like a silk vanish or something or the floating card on the stick that wasn't the show that was just the crowd gathering his Mm -hmm. entire show was cups and balls 
exactly. at the time was like what he could do 20 or 30 minutes on that one trick mm-hmm. and then be like, if you enjoy the show, there's my hat. And he would just rake in cash. Like he would swim in the cash. Still out there performing. I think he's in Key West and he's still killing it. Yeah. I mean, I guess he was trying to, after his stroke, he was, uh, he, cause he got sick again earlier this year and, or maybe it was last, what well, was, yeah, earlier last year. And, uh, I guess he's he I saw a month a couple months back that he was out trying to get back out at it. I mean that that man is a dog worker. He is one of like the he will grind it out. He's probably as far as street street magic goes. Yeah. And I don't I don't really consider David Blaine street magic. That's what he said he was doing. It really wasn't in the traditional sense. Mm-hmm. Man, Gazo's the legend. Yeah. Absolutely. I was able to I was last year, two years ago before everything. Um, I got to see one of his lectures. Yeah. And it was like 20, 20 people in the room. And it was just the, the tips. He was just going over a black marker and a red marker and saying why you don't use black on a red, black card and use a red one on a black card and use a black one on a red. And, and it's just the little things that you could tell. Like, that you never think about. Because all the rest of us just always used a black Sharpie in whatever card you pick. But it was like, no, there's a reason for that. Yeah, he's done it so many times. And he's like, yep. It's just the perfection and that's where you know like somebody's really owned their craft you know like it's not about the tricks he's talking about the stuff that you think doesn't matter that really does matter and it's the stuff the audience never sees they don't realize never. it's happening and when you get into that when you dig into that minutia especially of a street show but it could certainly be applied to a david copperfield show like those little things that you don't realize happened but you know in a 10 second span 25 different things just happened and that made the experience. So, yeah. Hey man, um, we're coming up on almost 50 minutes. Like I think you've been my longest show of the season so far. It's been fun chatting with you, I but let's, it. uh, let's go ahead and wrap up. Uh, everybody who comes on the show, we do a little speed round of questions. Yeah. So right. we're going to hit the speed round. You just give me your best answer. Are you ready? Okay. Yes. When you travel, name one item you have to have with you. Travel have to have with me. My toothbrush. Yeah, for sure. Uh, coolest place you've ever visited. Coolest place I ever visited is Disney. You find a spider in your house. Do you kill it or are you a catch and release guy? Um, recently a catch and release guy. Oh, recently. So it sounds yeah, like well, you used you used to be a stone cold spider killer. I'm I'm terrified of bugs. We grew up in New, I grew up in a city, so no bugs. I, I'm just scared of them. Oh and, please, uh, you grew up in New York. They got rats the size of like lawnmowers. It's different, but um, my daughter's into the, my daughter's into bugs, and recently we're we're catching them on the cups, looking at them, and then releasing them, trying to teach her the right thing. Oh well, that's excellent, excellent. Uh, now when you're learning something, like if you're learning a new magic trick, do you prefer to read the instructions, or would you rather watch a video when you're learning? Um, I'm a visual learner. I like to watch as I as I learn something, but I started to realize that in the magic business, the books are where the secrets are at. Yeah, no. That's that, real wait, I forget about. somebody that was a famous quote. Somebody said years ago, if you want to hide something, put it in a book. Exactly. And there's uh, a reason. For that. Yep. Last question. Little round of overrated or underrated. I'm going to list three things and I want to tell you to tell me whether it's overrated or underrated. Uh, number one, corn dogs. Underrated. Turkey legs. Underrated. Funnel cake. Overrated. Yeah. See, I would say overrated on the turkey leg. <laughs> but I guess when it's fair food, man, everybody's got their vibe. Everybody's got it. Listen, uh, Henry, it been really nice having you on the show. Where can folks learn more about your show? So um, you can go on my website is Rivera Magic. So Henry Rivera is my name, just RiveraMagic.com. If you need to find me, just put Henry of Magic, Henry Rivera Magic, and I'm popping up everywhere. Excellent. Well, we appreciate you being on the show today, buddy. It's been great uh, getting to visit with you for a little bit. To all of you who are listening, next week we got Michael Tipton from the Central Florida Fair. Looking forward to sharing that with you. Thanks for joining us this week. Bye-bye.